tell me tell me how does it work for for replication to happen does does the whole dna replicates in one go no no right it no, has pockets it's... the small small pockets in which the dna uh, opens and replication occurs right and then all these pieces are stitched yes, together right so and we call those regions from where it, a uh, replication begins as origin of replication so remember that yes sir in every yeah. chromosome there are specific dna sequences called the origin of replication where the dna polymerase comes and binds right and starts yes, the replication sir. yes so th that's why if i just put any piece of dna like the gene of insulin i put or the gene for melanin i put it will not do anything in the cell it will just be degraded right because it it does not contain by its in itself the origin of replication so for any piece of dna to be replicated inside a cell it has to become the part of the chromosome yes or no yes sir and this is how viruses work virus they are very very intelligent uh, molecularly when i say intelligent not like human kind of intelligent but they have a molecular intelligence that make them replicate inside inside our cell because when they, their genome enters it gets incorporated by uh, in, incorporated in the genome of the host and to an extent where you will the if you will after sequencing human genome we have realized that in millions and millions of years of evolution we have been attacked by viruses always to an extent where around 10% or i think more than 10% of our genome the sequence is virus sequence okay which is just lying there because we carry we have carried virus infection from generation to generation to generation for so millions of leave. years sorry it does not leave our body like it doesn't leave our, our body. body so once it gets incorporated we can overcome infection and kill all the virus particles and overall and after some mutations because these are regions which also keep getting mutated and become inactive but some portion of it stays okay when the virus replicates some portion is left behind and then we continue passing it on as a scar you know scar in our genome to our future generations so a, a a significant portion of our genome sequence is just virus the look the, the virus genome virus sequence okay that doesn't mean that yeah. you know, we will always have uh, infections coming up it just means that it attacked and stayed there so that's how viruses are successful we we want to achieve something similar uh, not something but exactly similar we want our okay. gene of interest to go and be the part of the chromosome so write down write down a question and an answer the question is why will why will a foreign piece of dna or a alien piece of dna why would a foreign piece of dna not be able to multiply not be able to multiply itself not be able to multiply itself so that's the question it's a it's... yeah they are not be able to multiply itself in the host cell in the host cell okay 
if somehow transferred if somehow transferred in it so if somehow i transfer that gene just the gene why will it not multiply so the answer is for dna replication it has to be a part of the chromosome for replication it is because for replication any piece of dna has to become a part of the chromosome any piece of dna has to become a part of the chromosome in the host cell in the host cell because only the chromosome only the chromosome contains specific dna sequence only the chromosome contains specific dna sequence specific dna sequence called the origin of replication called the origin of replication called the origin of replication which is responsible for initiating the process of replication which is important for initiating the process of replication is that clear yes sir so it's it it was not very easy to just put something in and it works then my question is if this is true then how is plasmid replicating in a bacteria and that also independent of the genetic material of the chromosome of the bacteria so bacteria just have one chromosome okay a single chromosome and plasmids do not rely on them they just replicate on their own it can it can just mean one thing what it can mean how are they doing it how can they potentially do it what is the logic if they are not dependent on chromosome of the bacteria which means they are not dependent on the origin of replication of the bacteria but they can still replicate on their own which means they which means come on come on go ahead i think you are right they have yes. they have what do they have they have their own origin of replication simple right yes sir see the logic remains the same either you so any piece of dna that i will send inside a cell i know that i cut it out from the genome it will not have its own origin of replication correct yes sir yeah and if something is replicating by its own in a bacteria it simply means one thing it is big enough to have its own origin of replication that's how plasmids can replicate make sense to you yes sir yes and that's why that's another reason why plasmids become very very useful to us because we we now can deliver anything through plasmids and it doesn't have to go and 
get incorporated into the chromosome of the host because we just need to put it in the plasmid and we know that plasmid replicates on its own. So it will replicate independent of the genome of the host bacteria. Correct? Yes, sir. And this also helps us in, in, in preventing any damage that we can do to the genome of the bacteria. See, if inserting it into the chromosome was only option, if we, if we did not have found plasmids, then we would have to incorporate it into the genome of the bacteria. Awesome. While doing that, let's say I tried to insert it, it got inserted somewhere where there was a very important gene already for the bacteria. Now that gene got inactive and bacteria will die. Make sense or not? Yes, sir. So chances of me killing bacteria instead of me taking the help of bacteria for my benefit is will go down. But with plasmids coming in, we are just happy. We are just like, oh, we, we don't have to touch the DNA uh, anymore. Does it make sir? sense to you? Yeah, tell me. Sir, but uh, why are we putting our gene of interest, in, inserting our gene of interest? In yes, that is the, that is, yes. Because the gene of interest is something which will make a medicine or a therapy or a drug or a chemical that humans need for their welfare. Why we are putting it is because there is a person, a human is not making insulin in its body. Now, there can be two reasons for it. One, maybe the gene of insulin in that human is faulty, right? That gene is not functional, it got mutated and it's not working anymore. It is not producing functional protein. Or second, the organ where insulin is produced, which is pancreas, has some issue, right? Yes, sir. In both the cases, the thing is that there is no insulin in the person's blood. And that's why the glucose level will keep on rising and the person will get diabetes. Now, if I can produce insulin outside somewhere, inject it into the person's blood, it will solve the problem for to some extent, right? I can the person can manage lack of insulin in its blood. That's what diabetic people do, right? They take insulin shots and, and they manage their blood glucose level. Yes, sir. Now, where where will I produce that insulin? Now, insulin is a protein that can be produced only in living systems. So what I can do, I can take the gene of interest from a human. I can take a human cell, cut out insulin gene from it. I'll tell you how to do that in this chapter. And that I can put it in a plasmid and put that plasmid into a bacteria. Now that bacteria will start producing insulin protein. Okay? Yes, sir. And later on, we sir. can purify that. Yeah, tell me. No, no, nothing, sir. Yeah. And later on, we can purify that protein out by killing the bacteria. Like burst, we will burst open all the bacterial cells. Everything in the cytoplasm will come out, including insulin. We will just purify insulin and nothing else. And after purifications, we will make injections and sell it to people as insulin shots. That's how science works. Correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so you understood yeah, why? Sir? Yeah. Yes, sir. I understood. Sir, uh, could you please uh, dictate this sentence? Uh, which sentence? Uh, why we are inserting our gene of interest in the plasmid? Yeah. So, uh, anyways, I will talk about it in detail. But if you want to write now, just write that our gene of interest. Our gene of interest is inserted in a host cell through plasmid, is inserted in a host cell through plasmid to express 
to express and obtain the desired protein product to express and obtain desired protein product okay yes sir perfect okay very well so let, let's go ahead in the chapter origin of replication is clear to you right yes sir very well so <clears throat> next question so next thing is let's let's learn more about plasmid then do you have your ncrt with you at the moment uh, sir i'll get it once again yeah just just fetch your ncrt yes sir yeah and come to page number wait i think i don't know there is a figure 9.4 of a of a plasmid vector i'm just trying to give you a before i go forward in the chapter i want to look i want you to look at it and understand what's that do you see so 9.4 pbr 322 322 so which page um i think it's 169 if you have the new books so in your books biotechnology is which chapter number uh for us sir biotechnology this is it chap chapter 9 no sir it is chapter 11 11 so you have the previous version of the books where the syllabus is not deleted so it might be then figure 11.4 or something just check 11.4 yes sir. the new new revised ncrts i think they omitted some chapters and biotechnology is chapter 9 the first chapter is gone i guess anyways so did you find 11.4 e coli cloning vector pbr 322 yes. yeah just look at it so do you see so it is a what it is representing it is representing a double stranded circular piece of dna okay yes sir and you don't have to worry about anything that's written there just look at a region which is shaded and it is written as ori do you see a region ori yes sir blue color green color yes that ori is origin of replication region that's present in the plasmid so that's why plasmids can self replicate make sense yes sir okay very well now let's come back um, to where we were write down another question <clears throat> what is cloning what is cloning now cloning is simple simply in simple terms it is making multiple identical copies of any dna template write down making multiple identical copies i'll write it here also making multiple making multiple identical copies identical copies of any dna template okay yes sir 
Now, if I am putting a gene inside through the plasmid, I want that plasmid to replicate and when it will replicate, it will automatically make multiple copies of my gene, right? I just inserted one gene and by replication, it will make 100, 200, 1000 copies of it. Is it clear? Yes or no? Yes. So whenever I'm using a plasmid for replicating my gene, I'm basically what I'm doing, I'm doing gene cloning. So this yes, is called sir. gene cloning. Is so it clear? There, yeah. There will be yeah. no mutation, sir. Uh, I, uh, ideally, no. But you ask a very good question. No system is error prone, right? So when we are replicating, there are chances of, um, you know, unaccounted mutations that can happen. But we are like, we are not sending huge chunks of genome that if there is a mutation, we are sending genes. So the chances, and even if it is, there is a mutation, it will be like in one copy out of 10,000, right? Mutations are not very, very common. Like they are common in lower organisms more than in higher organisms. But even if I make thousand copies, one might have some tiny mutation that will be a faulty copy. Still, I will get thousand working copies, right? Yes, sir. So for our um, understanding, we will just assume that mutation is not going to uh, screw or affect our experiment or our gene cloning. Okay. So yes, we are sir. making multiple identical copies. And these copies are made in millions and millions inside a cell. So one faulty won't be a problem. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. If but but the problem is if there is a if there is a mutation in the gene that we are sending, then it is a problem. So the template that we are sending through the plasmid vector that should not have a mutation. Otherwise, we will end up sending a. That's why before we send any part of the DNA, we sequence it. We sequence and we know the exact sequence of the gene. So that should be taken from an organism that does not have mutation in that gene. That's where it's important. Okay, Parker. So that's a very yes. good point you brought, you brought up. Yeah. So uh, people also define plasmid as in one line, autonomous replicating, autonomously replicating circular extra chromosomal DNA. You can write down autonomously Replicating. So can you please write the spelling of autonomously? Yes, I will. So we are defining plasmid here. Auto. No, mostly. Replicating. It means replicating on its own. And it's circular, so autonomously replicating circular extra chromosomal. This also makes sense, right? It is not a part of chromosome. It is an extra chromosomal DNA. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> Now, how was this whole thing discussed? Yes, yes, Parker. You have a question? No, sir, it wasn't a question. I was saying like another point for it. Mm -hmm. Tell me, tell me. Like who has its own uh, origin of replication? Yes, yeah, so when we say autonomously replicating, it we kind of, we are making it clear only that it has its own origin of replication. Otherwise, anything which does not have an origin of replication cannot be autonomously replicating. It has to depend on the chromosome then. Right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So you don't have to write it if you are saying autonomously replicating. It's clear. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Now, what Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer were doing in the, in the early 1970s is they figured out that some bacteria they have antibiotic resistance, right? 
So yes, bacteria sir. over time develop antibiotic resistance, which their ancestors were not having. So before we invented antibiotic, before we discovered antibiotic, like Alexander Fleming, before he discovered antibiotic, we were not using antibiotics to kill bacteria, right? So bacteria were not resistant to antibiotics. Later on, when they started uh, getting antibiotic resistance, they figured out that basically this antibiotic resistance is coming from a plasmid which contain a gene which is responsible for giving them this resistance. Okay? Yes, sir. Do you understand? So this bacteria picked up DNA from somewhere, some other place, um, in the form of a plasmid. And this gene in the plasmid gave the bacteria antibiotic resistance. So what they did, they used the restriction enzymes, which was uh, discovered by uh, Boyer. They used these res restriction enzymes and cut that part of DNA from the plasmid out. Okay. And then uh, <clears throat> they took that part of the DNA, which is which was responsible for providing antibiotic resistance. And they linked it with another plasmid where it was not present. And then this plasmid, um, a host organism, right? Now you will, you will hypothesize that when you send this antibiotic resistance gene to another host organism, which was not antibiotic resistant, after getting this plasmid, if it starts showing resistance, which means the whole assay has worked. Yes or no? Yes, sir. So we are able to give abilities to organisms which they were not possessing. And what is the marker here? How will you know that this assay has worked? We are working with bacterial yes, cells. So can, can you think of an experiment? Yeah, tell me. Suppose you did it. You took an antibiotic resistance gene from one bacteria's plasmid, put it into a, another plasmid and put it in another bacteria, which was not resistant. Now you are telling me that this bacteria now got resistant. I am asking, how can you prove it? How can you prove it? Because previously it wasn't resistant, but now that I inserted it in, now I can see that it is uh, antibiotic resistant. But you can't see anything. You, you, what you will see is a liquid in your hand. You can't see bacteria. So how will you prove know. that they are antibiotic resistant? Yeah. This is the question. You have to do something to tell me that, see, this is happening, so they are antibiotic resistant. If I am saying that this glass is bulletproof, I am asking proof, prove it that it's bulletproof. What will you do? I will shoot it. You will shoot a bullet at it. If it is surviving, it's a bulletproof glass. So if I am saying that this bacteria is antibiotic resistant, what will you do? I will add Perfect. antibiotic to see if Perfect. it dies. Perfect. So see, you are already a scientist now. And where do we grow bacteria? On culture plates, right? On agar plates. Have you seen these plates in your school or somewhere in experiments? These are no, small, sir. small plates. No, okay. So let me let me give you a gist of it. So what happens is uh, we have these culture plates like this, okay? Which are like a little thick at the, this is like a dish full of agar, agaros, okay, for a medium. You can also culture bacteria on a potato. Robert Koch, the father of, we call it microbiology, he cultured bacteria on potato slice because what a bacteria needs to grow is food, a source of sugar or starch, right? So that yes, you sir. give. And then you take one drop of the solution in which you, you know that there are bacteria and then you spread it around on this, okay? When you spread it around, let's say, uh, let me use a color. Uh, let's use a light color, yeah. 
So I will spread around. You can see the color. Yes, sir. I will spread the bacterial culture everywhere on this plate or on the potato slice anywhere. And after some time, what I will see is uh, one second. Molds. Yeah, you will see colonies. If it, if it was a fungus, you will see molds. You're right. So you will see some small, small colonies like this growing on that plate. Okay. Everywhere. You understand? Yes, sir. This means that the bacteria is growing. One is making two, two is making four, and substantially they are making a huge colony, which is which which you see as a dot. Now to prove that after giving your plasmid, the bacteria is antibiotic resistance, what you will do in this media, before putting bacteria, you will add antibiotic and then introduce bacteria. And if there is no colony, all your bacteria are dead. They are not antibiotic resistant. But if after transferring the plasmid, there are colonies still, then it means antibiotic resistant. Yes. So they are growing in an antibiotic medium and they are antibiotic resistant. So this they showed and the whole process worked. People were very, very happy. Oh, great. We can take piece of DNA from some place and put it into some other organism and it can give the other organism uh, a different ability. Now the marker here is antibiotic resistant gene, right? Do you understand yes. why antibiotic resistant gene is a marker? Because that can directly tell you if the plasmid has been inserted successfully and is successfully translating, then the bacteria gets antibiotic resistance. Cool? Yes, sir. Now we can go one step further. We can design a plasmid where we have origin of replication because that's very important. We have an antibiotic resistant gene in it because that will be our marker so that we can, we can see if our transformation has worked or not. And third thing we can have in that plasmid is our gene of interest. That could be an insulin gene, a melanin gene, or any other gene which, that you want to express and purify the protein of. Right? Yes, sir. And how we will do the assay, how we will do the screening the same way. We will take a bacteria which is not antibiotic resistant. We will put this plasmid. And if now they are antibiotic resistant, it means our plasmid has worked. And if it has worked to give the bacteria antibiotic resistant, it also must be producing my gene of interest, right? Because I put yes. both together. So that's what biotechnology is in a gist. So you understood the process, right? Yes, sir. Brilliant. So that's that's all about it. Now let, let me quickly uh, keep telling you some important things. So what is a restriction enzyme? First of all, write down. Boyer, we talked about some. So I'm making you familiar with everything that, every technical term that is present in this chapter before we go in details. So what is a restriction Enzyme. The enzymes that cut open the plasmid. So that. Yeah, not just the plasmid, restriction enzyme cut open DNA. They are called molecular scissors because they are molecules and they exactly do one thing they cut the strands. Cut means they break the bonds between molecules. So these enzymes, write down, restriction enzymes are called molecular scissors. Restriction enzymes are called molecular scissors. Okay. And what is the source of this enzyme? From where we got it? Bacteria only. Why do you think bacteria has this enzyme in the first place? Or other organisms do, who have this? Why do you think organisms have this kind of an enzyme to cut DNA? 
to cut DNA. Why? Why would you like to cut DNA? When you cut DNA, you are causing a damage to DNA, right? Our cell yeah. has a DNA repair mechanism. You know, by chance, if you cut, if by any injury or you know by UV exposure, if a human DNA gets cut or breaks are there, then there are repair mechanisms in our body that repair that break. We call it double-stranded break repair or single-stranded break repair. So why do you think some organism will have something opposite to cut DNA? Think about, there is a bacteria living very happily alone, you know, jolly, singing, eating, replicating. Suddenly a virus attacks, sends its DNA inside the bacteria cell to hijack the cell, to infect the cell and make multiple copy of its own. So these restriction enzymes are the defense mechanisms of bacteria to protect themselves from any other foreign DNA that will enter. So they will not use this restriction enzyme to cut their own DNA, but they will use it to chop any other DNA that will come in. So if you chop it up, it will never get incorporated in your own DNA and the infection will not spread. Make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. So they're like swords that you keep for protections uh, of your, of your uh, kingdom. Now we took these enzymes and we started using it for our benefit. Till date, we have found around more than 900 different restriction enzymes from different strains of bacteria. And all these restriction enzymes cut DNA at a particular sequence. They identify a particular sequence, a very specific sequence. So every enzyme has a different sequence that it identifies and cut the DNA there. Okay. Sir? Yes. Okay. Sir, do we have restriction enzymes? Do we have, as in like our own restriction enzymes? Yes, sir. In, in uh, which is, which is, which, which is produced inside the human cell you're asking. Yes, sir. Um, we have, um, uh, actually to be, it's a good question. So there is one restriction enzyme called, I'm not wrong. It's called H sal, H S A L. And it is present in the embryos of the human. Yeah. And it is, it is a restriction enzyme. So even humans have restriction enzymes. So how do we get affected by viruses if we have them? Then? Because uh, we don't have too much, too many first. And second, as I told you that restriction enzymes uh, recognize a specific sequence. So the viruses that, that are able to infect us might not have that specific sequence. So they can just, you know, they can't get, and each and every cell of our body does not have that. So H cell, if I am not wrong, H cell has been found in the, from the human embryos. I'm not sure if uh, adult in adults that is present in the cell and it's functional or not. I think not. Yeah. And yeah. we get affected by viruses because viruses have various mechanisms evolved to evade our immune system and to evade uh, if there is any restriction enzyme. To evade simply, it means you do, if you don't have, for example, let's say um, I have a sword and a person who is holding the sword that's my restriction enzyme. And I told that person, whenever you see something yellow, attack. Because my enemy's color was yellow. Okay. But my enemy was wise. The enemy changed the color from yellow to green. Now the restriction enzyme cannot recognize it anymore. Do you understand? That's evolution of viruses. Now what we have to do is we also have to evolve new restriction enzymes. But the problem is, if you have free-floating restriction enzymes in human cells, 
many of them they can also affect our own rna and you know mitochondrial dna things like that so hsal is one that i am aware of is a restriction enzyme which is present in humans but hsal alone cannot cut all the dna is coming from all bacteria and virus that's why we get hsal must be cutting some so the thing is if you don't get an infection so if a virus enters your body okay but you don't get a infection will you ever know that the virus entered your body no exactly so if hsal is preventing protecting you from something you will never know it because it it protected nothing happened you never went to the doctor you never got checked you never gave your sample no one figured out which virus is present in the sample you will only go to the doctor once you have infection and you, it, you the fact that you have infection clearly means that hsal could not protect you from that yeah yes sir yeah good question i'll also read upon it more and maybe we can discuss okay maybe i'll find more examples of human restriction enzymes i'm even not sure if many have been found or discovered because people mostly focus on finding restriction enzymes from bacteria because this is what we use in biotechnology as our model system to produce any kind of um product gene product or protein okay yes sir so yeah but you write this name and think find a little bit about it i'll also go thanks for refreshing the memory hsal that's a human restriction enzyme re they are called re restriction enzyme yeah you had another question yes sir sir if um, like a pregnant woman she gets affected by a virus so like mm -hmm. will the will like the the baby is not really a uh, developed it's like in, in the embryonic stage mm -hmm. so will the baby also get affected yeah. by the virus yeah that's a very good question it depends on if the virus is capable of um crossing the placenta right so as you know in the reproductive chapter i taught you mother's blood never mixes with the baby's blood right it is a myth in society that we are we are made up of our mother's blood we are not we make our own blood in when we develop as a fetus that's why a baby's blood group can be very can be different from a mother's blood group if we were formed from our mother's blood and this misconception comes because if there is a abortion or a miscarriage you know along with baby's blood mother's blood also come out as a miscarriage right yes sir a piece of flesh and during menses also mother's blo blood flows out so people in earlier times did not know the scientific mechanisms so they got this misconception and even in in culture and in in religious text you will find this that babies are formed from their mother's blood that's not true so we form our own blood and there is a barrier between mother's blood and baby's blood all the time that and that is placenta right so if the yes. virus can has the ability to cross placenta which mostly many viruses most of the viruses can do because they are very very tiny they can just cross through diffusion sometimes then it can infect the baby as well but if it cannot or if you can prevent it from going into the placenta then you can protect the baby from the infection uh, even if the mother is infected okay yes sir for example hiv virus can be passed on from the mother to the baby so in that case the baby will be born will be born with that infection right it can pass on most viruses can yeah okay yes sir okay cool <clears throat> so this restriction enzymes are of two types one is called 
exonucleus restriction exonucleus and the other is called endonucleus okay now the word exo look at the word i always look at the word in biology it makes things easier nucleus and exo exo means out outer or outside nucleus the word is a s e always means an enzyme ligase topoisomerase polymerase hexokinase nucleus in in your digestive chapter you you read peptidase protease amylase all these are enzymes DNA. because they end with dnas yes perfect degrades nucleoside on uh, oh, sorry nucleotides so out exonuclease means this enzyme cuts the dna from the side so if this is a piece of dna okay it will start cutting it from this sides so it's like chewing it up so one by one it will take bases from both the sides you understand yes sir now that brings me to a question i told you plasmids are protected more than linear dna in the cell can you think why why are plasmids more stable and protected than linear dna because exonucleases cannot work on a plasmid plasmids do not have ends it is a ring make sense no so can you explain again yeah so exonuclease starts chewing up the dna or degrading the dna from the ends loose ends so if it is a long dna this is one end let's say this is 5 prime end and this is 3 prime end right of the dna the red region is from where the exonuclease will start degrading it from both the ends okay yes but sir. a plasmid is like this it is closed can, can you tell me which is the 5 prime end and which is the 3 prime end of a plasmid no sir no it is a circle so can exonucleases degrade a plasmid you can degrade a plasmid from the side right sir Where, what side there is no side it is which side so this is a dna the only side is where you have nothing so this is the open side right yes sir this has to be the open side so this is where it attacks these corners it takes one sugar one base at a time and it starts chewing so it's chewing up from the sides it's like you chew up uh, a a long pasta ramen or a chowmin but if i make a ring from where will you start chewing it right you understood what i'm trying to say so exonucleus yes. cannot work if there are no loose ends of the dna so that's why they're called exo they work from outer side either from this side or this side but endonuclease the word endo means inside right inside yes sir now they are able to cut a dna whether it is a straight dna or it is a circular dna okay doesn't matter which dna it is even if it's a circular dna it will have sequences here atgc base pairs right here also there will be sequences make sense yes sir yeah so what exo endonucleases do is that they recognize a sequence let's say there is a exonuclease they recognize a a t g c c so here also it could be a a t g c c and exonuclease this particular exonuclease cuts between t and g so wherever it will find this sequence it will sit here bind to a a bind to c c and cut between t and g okay 
So if this sequence is present, endonuclease can cut. So endonuclease can work on a linear DNA. It can also work on a plasmid DNA. So now if I ask you, which kind of restriction enzyme can be used to make recombinant DNA using plasmids? Will it be exonuclease or will it be endonuclease? Endonuclease. Perfect. So from now, from this point onwards, whenever I talk about restriction enzyme, automatically I am talking about endonuclease. Endonucleases. Okay. We don't have to worry about exonucleases anymore in this chapter. But you know that there are two kinds of restriction enzymes. And we have isol yeah, we have isol we have isolated um, around hundreds and hundreds of restriction enzymes. Um, from various strains of bacteria. The first one, so these are called tools. So now we are, we are going into understanding the tools of recombinant DNA technology. So first tool, tools of recombinant DNA technology. This technology is nothing but the ability to make a recombinant DNA. A recombinant, the word recombinant means which is a recombination of two things, a plasmid and our gene of interest. When they are both together in a combination, we call it a recombinant DNA. Make sense? Yes, okay. sir. And we need some tools to make it. The first tool is a endonuclease, restriction endonuclease. Okay. And yes, the sir. first restriction endonuclease uh, was isolate, which was isolated, was named. Just write down. Hind two. This was the first restriction endonuclease, which was discovered and isolated. Okay, now. Let me quickly tell you about how are they named. So when we when we name something, okay, uh, th there has to be a logic before because if you do not have logic in naming, then upcoming discoveries won't follow the same thing, and you will have any random name being given, and it will be difficult to keep a track on that, right? So they made a. Um, <clears throat> they made a standard. Yes. So every uh, restriction endonuclease, the first alphabet, which is H here, talks about the genus of the source organism or of the bacteria. The next two or the next one mostly it's two, is about the species, okay? And the last one, which is D here, mostly about the strain of the bacteria. And then this Roman number is the Uh, the Roman number is the sequence of discovery or uh, wait one second. The Roman number is uh, the order. Yes. The order of isolation. Okay. From the strain. So Hind 2 Basically, H is hemophilus. Species is influenzae. This is the bacteria. Hemophilus influenzae. Strain D. And it was the second to be isolated. From so the strain. But I said that this is the first, this was the first 
yes, restriction sir. in the nucleus, right? So if yes, it was sir. the second, if it was the second enzyme to be isolated, and it is the first endonuclease, then what was the first enzyme? It was the exonuclease. Simple, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So whatever was one order one from this particular strain was not an endonucleus, was an exonucleus. It's simple, no? Make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So there is another one uh, which is given in your books. It's called Eco R1. Now you can tell me very quickly. E stands for? Genus. Yeah. What is the genus here? Escrichia. CO is coli. So it comes from E. coli. R is the strain. strain. And Roman one is the Order first, of isolation. first to be isolated from the R strain of E. coli. Okay. Yes, sir. Make sense? Exonuclease, yeah. endonuclease, everything is clear? Yes, sir. How do we name all that part is also clear? Yes, so sir. first tool is clear to you, right? Yes, sir. Restriction enzymes. But that's not enough. We just have enzyme. What is the second thing we need? We need vectors in which we can clone our gene, cloning vectors. Now, the cloning vector are these plasmids or other vectors that we have uh, developed uh, that we will talk about in the next class then and which cloning vector is best and why it is the best and what are what are the best uh, what are the characteristic that every cloning vector should have is what we are going to do in the next class so in the next class we'll finish first the tools these two things restriction enzymes and the vector and then we'll go to doing this process of a recombinant DNA, making a recombinant DNA. And I think this whole chapter is just about that. So I guess this chapter will take three more classes, three classes just because it's all about processes. Uh, the next chapter is application, which will take a little time. Okay, so in next class, we'll finish, we'll try to finish tools and come to um, making or we'll finish tools only. It will take some time to talk about cloning vectors. But do one thing, read cloning vectors and what you could not do, you could not revise trans, uh, sorry, replication and transcription. So please do that also before you come to the next class. You have time, right? You have ample of time before you come on Monday. So you have yes, to revise sir. replication, transcription and the chapter cloning from the book. Yes, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, see you in the next class. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, yeah. one more thing, I'm so sorry. Yes, yes, you have questions? Uh, no, sir, uh, can you please uh, dictate um, self-replication, uh, the advantages and the disadvantages? Uh, self-replication of the, of the plasmid, you're saying? Plasmid. Yes. Sir. Yeah, right. So write down uh, the self-replication property Self replication property of the plasmid. Self replication property of the plasmid is advantageous. Is advantageous to use it as a cloning vector to use it as a cloning vector for our gene of interest. And next point for our gene of interest, next point, plasmids have their own origin of replication. And if you are making a synthetic, uh, like just stop here and uh, answer me. And if you are making artificial cloning vector, 
then if it doesn't have its own origin of replication, then you have to put a origin of replication sequence. Make sense? Yes, sir. Uh, so plasmids have either its own origin of replication or the origin of replication sequence inserted artificially. Origin of replication? Sequence. Sequence inserted artificially. Like we insert our gene of interest, right? Similarly, yes, we will also insert origin of replication sequence. So in the next class, anyways, I, I'm going to talk about origin of replication and all the characteristics of 